This video shows the requirements, the calculation, post hoc testing, effect size calculation and interpretation, as well as reporting the results for the one-way ANOVA in R. Its purpose is testing three or more groups for differences in their means. For example, I have a group variable depicting whether the person has no degree, a bachelor's or a master's degree. I use the one-way ANOVA to test for a difference in the average income between those three groups. The requirements for the one-way ANOVA are the following. Three or more independent groups, a dependent variable on the interval or ratio scale, normally distributed residuals and homogeneous variances across groups. First question. What has to be approximately normally distributed? It is not the dependent variable, but rather the residuals of the ANOVA that should be normally distributed. Simply put, residuals are the difference between values predicted by the model and observed values for the dependent variable. There are three possible ways to test this. First, an analytical test like the Shapiro-Wilk test. Second, a histogram. Or third, a QQ plot. The Shapiro-Wilk test is oversensitive to unimportant deviations from normal distribution in large samples. This is a phenomenon for all analytical tests, for which you can find a source in the video description. A QQ plot is the easiest to interpret, therefore we continue creating one for the residuals of the ANOVA. The residuals, along other values, can be calculated and saved into a vector, for example m, using the lm function, lm being linear model, which ANOVA basically is. Simply put the dependent variable first, followed by tilt, the small wave symbol, and then the group variable. Finish with adding the data frame that holds your data. Next up, we need the very convenient ggpubr package. Use its ggqqplot function and within it the residuals function on the vector that holds the results from the previous calculation. The interpretation of the qqplot is straightforward. The dots represent the residuals and the line the perfect normal distribution. Therefore, the distances between the dots and the line should be minimized. Again, there will be acceptable deviations, especially on the edges of the distribution, meaning the upper right-hand corner and the lower left-hand corner. For my residuals, deviations in the top right-hand corner and in the lower left-hand corner can be a bit problematic. If you are in doubt, you might consider going with the crystal wallace test, which is the non-parametric alternative to the one-way ANOVA, and for which I have linked a playlist to go from A to Z. For testing the assumption of homogeneity of variances, an eye test can be simply looking at the variance of the test variable for each group. For that purpose, you can use the describe by function of the psych package. Put the test variable first, then your group variable. Be aware that this function shows only the square root of the variances, the standard deviation. You can roughly estimate or even calculate the respective variances though. Another widespread option is the Levine's test, which tests the null hypothesis of equal variances. However, this test is flawed in two ways and should be avoided. A. It's oversensitive with large samples as a result of higher power. Negligible differences will cause the test to reject the null hypothesis wrongly, a type 1 error. Information on that phenomenon can be found in the sources in the video description. B. With smaller samples, the test lacks power and you will be more likely to falsely retain the null hypothesis, committing a type 2 error. It is therefore advised to check the residuals and the fitted values against each other. For this, use the plot function on your residuals and request the graph by adding comma 1. The red line should be as straight as possible, meaning it should be parallel to the x-axis, represented by the dotted line. In my example, I have a small dent and a few outliers on the two right-hand columns, which can be of concern. If you are in doubt, you should go for the Welsh ANOVA, which corrects for unequal variances. Or you can fall back to the non-parametric Kruskal-Wallis test. As a first step, I want to see some descriptive statistics to get a first idea of my data. I recommend the psych package for that and its described by function. Please note that it is advised to have the group variable as a factor. Put the test variable first and then add the group variable separated by a comma. I can see that the mean is higher for a higher degree. I also tend to have unequal variances, which are ignored for the purpose of showing you the basic ANOVA calculation. You can also visualize the three groups by using box plots and seeing the interquartile range represented by the height of the box and the median by the black horizontal lines respectively. The circled cases have the 1.5 times interquartile range distance to the edges of the box and are sometimes referred to as outliers. Now I want to test whether the means are significantly different from each other. I use the ANOVA underscore test function of the R statics package. I start off with the test variable, the income. After that I use tilde, the small wave symbol, and put the group variable, the degree, behind it. When I run this line, I get the results. If the p-value is below the predefined threshold, for example 0.05, the null hypothesis can be rejected. 
Reminder, the null hypothesis for the one-way ANOVA assumes no difference of the means between the tested groups. In my case, I defined alpha as 0.05 and can therefore reject the null hypothesis because my p-value is very small with 0.00805. I can therefore conclude that the means are different. After a significant one-way ANOVA, post-hoc tests should be calculated. To achieve this, pairwise comparisons are being done. Those are simply multiple two-sample t-tests. I will load the R statics package and use its pairwise underscore t underscore test function in combination with pipes. I'll start with the data frame and add the pipes operator behind it. The next line is the pairwise underscore t underscore test function that has the dependent variable followed by the tilt, the small wave symbol and the group variable. The pool.sd equals true argument should be used when you have equal variances. Since I have unequal variances, I'm using equals false. Finally, the p-adjust method argument is required to counter the alpha error inflation caused by multiple pairwise comparisons. The easiest and also most conservative one is the Bonferroni, where your p-value will be multiplied with the number of pairwise comparisons being done. Other methods like Holm, FDR and so forth can be found in the documentation of the pairwise underscore t underscore test function and used accordingly. Albeit, your choice needs to be justified, at least with research field specific standards. Eventually, we get a table that shows all pairwise comparisons. In the last two columns, their respective adjusted p-values are shown as well as significance indicators on the 5% alpha level. In my example, I can observe a difference between no degree and master's degree. The no degree and bachelor's degree group have a p-value some might still consider for further investigation and or interpretation. Please consult the paper, the ASA statement on p-values and draw your own conclusions. Finally, you might have a significant one-way ANOVA and no low enough p-values in post-hoc testing when controlling for alpha error inflation. That is not a contradiction and the internet is full of discussions about this phenomenon of significant tests and non-significant post-hoc tests. Just keep in mind that a p-value, to which it all boils down to, is a function of sample size, which decreases with an increase in sample size for any effect size that is different from zero. A non-significant test result in almost all cases tells you you're lacking statistical power as a result of too small of a sample. Don't, and I repeat, please don't do post hoc power analysis to justify your non-findings, because the observed power is a one-to-one -one function of the p-value. After doing post hoc tests, you should calculate the effect sizes for observed differences. It is common practice to calculate the effect size d after observing differences in pairwise t-tests. First, we need the R statics package, which by now will be already active. I'll start with the data frame and add the pipe operator. The next line is the Cohen's underscore D function that has the dependent variable followed by tilt, the small wave symbol and the group variable. The effect size can be found in the column F size. Please note that effect sizes will always be reported as positive values. The negative sign is caused by the order of the groups. Finally, you have to classify the magnitude of the effects for which you consider the p-value being small enough. I already mentioned that dichotomizing the decision against the null hypothesis by strictly looking at the p-value should be avoided. The magnitudes provided here are from Cohen 92, a power primer, page 157. If the effect size exceeds 0.2, it is a small effect. If it exceeds 0.5, it is a medium effect. And if it exceeds 0.8, it can be classified as a large effect, as is the case in my example. However, please check if similar studies in your research field exist and compare your effect size with the given ones. If no comparable study exists, use the common thresholds within your research field. If those are also non-existent, you can do what I did. You can refer to Cohen 92, a power primer. When you're done, you have to write up the results. First, one formulates whether the groups are different or not, providing the test statistic alongside the degrees of freedom as well as the p-value. In case of calculated post hoc tests, the observed group differences with a small enough p-value are reported. When you were able to observe an effect, report the calculated effect size d. Finally, the magnitude of this effect size is classified with, for example, Cohen 92 or the respective research field specific thresholds. 